Hi everyone, welcome to the live Hands Up For Trad afternoon show. It was a lovely weekend again in Loch Lomond, where we spent, which we spent trying to stop the slugs eating our new hosta plants. Our garden is now full of beer traps and copper wire, but needless to say, the slugs defeated all our, all our attempts and enjoyed their meal as usual. If you think your friends will like Hands Up For Trad afternoon show, please share and tag Hands Up For Trad. And please shout out and tell us where you're watching from. Welcome to all our guests today, Scary Vohr, John McCusker, Michael McGoldrick, and later we'll meet Brianna Wilson. How's it going, everybody? Hi, Hello. Simon. Hello. Hi, Hi. Simon. How you doing? Tell me, do you have any hosta plants in your garden? It's the very first time I've ever heard the word hosta, <laughs> and I've heard the word oh. plant before. And we've hosta. got plenty of slugs. We've got loads of slugs, yeah, just no plants for them to feed them anything, just slugs in the house. Yeah, well, these, and slugs. these beer, beer traps are great because you get to fill them full of tenants, perfect, and then you get in the morning, you used to get you're able to go down and empty the dead ones out. It's pretty cool, actually. Interesting. <laughs> nice weekend. I thought you would have been into that, Daniel. <laughs> cool <laughs> anyway, before we get I going, mean, we're... <laughs> before anyway, before we get going, we have got a great video from the fiddler Daniel Hunter. That's amazing, Daniel. That was actually quite death defying with a fiddle and a ball. So, welcome, Scary Vore. How are you doing? Good, thanks, Simon. How's yourself? <laughs> yes, we're very happy to have both Martin and Daniel Gillespie and Alec Dalgleish from the band. Congratulations on your single, Every Day, Day Heroes. It did really well in the charts, didn't it? I think Martin's trying to talk there, but he's still not even there, is he? No, he's not having any luck there at all. No. Some, someone else tell us. Yeah. <laughs> well, when I, I, I thought the Scary Vore single was, went really well. I was delighted. <laughs> That's John McCusker talking, <laughs> even though his mic should be muted. John, even in Scary Vore. We're going to let Martin talk about it since Martin actually... Martin wrote the tune and came up with the concept of doing it, but yeah, it did did better than we expected and went into the charts. And uh, what did where did it actually finish up, Dan? Do you remember what all the, the actual stats were for it? It was number one single in Scotland. I don't know what the actual end in in UK was, but then it was the highest new entry in the iTunes chart in the UK uh, as well. But uh, I mean, it was just amazing um, how many people got involved with the the track overall in terms of playing around the world and messages coming in from, from all people all over the world supporting it so it was uh, something that came together pretty quickly and uh, an, an idea probably quicker we did that in quicker in isolation than we normally do in, in the studios and stuff so uh, it was cool and it kept us kept our, our minds on something when generally every other day it's cancelled gigs and stuff so it was nice to have something positive to work on and, and support you know what is a very important cause as well so how did you actually pull it together? Because it was quite an undertaking. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Sorry, I'm gonna go. I was just going to say, uh, Scott Wood, who's uh, one of our band members, has also got a studio. So um, Martin sort of got the tune to him and he put together a sort of basic backing of, uh, of sorts for everybody to kind of play over. And then it got sent to some of the other ones who've got studio stuff in the house. And then we all put our bits down as best we could. So, for example, like our, our drummer, Fraser, doesn't have a set up to be able to play full kit where he can record it. So we got Rory Grinley from Skipnish to do the drums on it and stuff. So it became sort of scary more and friends. Uh, and loads of other people got involved in doing the bits, uh, you know, that the, the band members couldn't do as well. So it was kind of just came came together completely uh, remotely. So it was quite quite cool uh, making, it, making it work that way. And as Dan said, it came together quicker than us normally trying to get into a studio and 
you know, get things going. So, well, let's watch a clip of it now. It's a, it's a great video actually. I laughed it when I watched it because all these the um, wee red and blue accordions. And uh, when I brought one home from Mull one day, all my um, my wife's family are all Celtic fans and they just couldn't believe it. <laughs> they brought the Rangers accordion home. Protestant <laughs> accordion. So tell me, um, tell me about um, how Scary Four started. When when did it start? 2005, believe it or not, is when uh, we officially became Scary War. We actually were messing around playing tunes and wandering up and down the islands for a few years before that. But 2005 was when we, we actually named the band Scary War and recorded what was the first album. Uh, so this year is our, our 15th year uh, as a band, believe it or not. And um, we were planning a big uh, celebration show at Inverary Castle, but sadly we had to, to cancel that along with that. Uh, a few tours for this year planned but we're raking our brains together we'll still try and do something and, and, and celebrate 15 years but yeah it's been the time's flown and can't quite believe it's, it's 15 years but that's how long it's been and how do you come up with all the the songs and the tunes for the band uh, do you write them together or alec do you write the songs um, I'm, I'm mostly write the songs yeah and i'll i'll uh sort of do the writing and then demo them up in the flat and then send them through to the guys and see what they think. And if it gets if it gets enough of a thumbs up, then that goes forward as a song and then meet up and rehearse and sort of arrange further together. And with the tunes, it's mostly mostly the uh, the instrumental players that do that as well. Ma- Martin's written a lot of our tune sets and he usually comes into the studio with the, with the tunes sort of done. Uh, and then again, we come together and sort of put an arrangement to it as well. So... Um, we don't really write all together as one big group uh, as much as we write separately and then arrange it together. Oh, I see. Yes, I well, um, I was uh, looking the other day there, and uh, oh my goodness, things are going wrong today. <laughs> oh man, who's everyone's disappearing? Oh, good, right, cool. Um, uh, Martin has disappeared. <laughs> Anyway, the, uh, I was laughing the other day there because I was looking at the brand new look for Scary Vore. Uh, this, uh, the fabulous Martin and his uh, pink wig. Is this, do you see this as a way forward? I think, I think it's going to be my new, uh, my new gigging outfit, I think, from now on. So. I trialled it first in a, doing the part bar quiz a couple of Saturdays ago, so I thought on Thursday when the BBC were coming to film me, I thought I'd fire the wig on again and give everybody a laugh. So. 
Well, I think it's good actually. I think everyone, we all, everyone got to see that on the video there, so they now know what to look out for in the next Scary Board gig. <laughs> um, we're going to play now the uh, the Take My Hand video. Can you tell us about that? Because that's from your 2008 album, isn't it? Yeah, so that was the sort of main the main single from that album. Um, and it's just a kind of song that I wrote. I just kind of wanted to have a summer summer love song kind of vibe that I thought folk would kind of get gotten bored with. So um, it became the, the sort of the, the big single. And uh, it's kind of been a bit of a real honour because a lot of folk have used it as their, their first dance at weddings and stuff like that. So we get a lot of requests for for us doing sort of special mentions for people who get, get married and use it as a first dance. So and who are the a people of a, in the... a romantic number. And who are the people in the video? I don't actually know. We don't personally know them. Uh, Donald Ewan McKinnon did the video and he sort of just put together the whole thing and, and got actors and actresses and stuff to do it. So he came up with that concept and did a great job of it. So that, that's not our thing at all, the whole, the whole video concept. But yeah, so I, we don't personally know the actors. It's a great looking video. And if anyone wants to find out more about Scary Vore, they can go to scaryvore.com. There's loads of stuff there. And you guys, and check out all their social media as well, because you do a great job just bringing people and talking to people and everything. It's definitely worthwhile. Let's have a wee look at Take My Hand, though. Into the night, young, pure and free. Take my hand. Summer would seem so long And we'd sing our favorite songs We heard them on the radio It was long ago An endless night and laughter until the dawn A time when our dreams were born Paved the way for all we have and all we need Take my That's a great song. I just want to say a few hellos and shout outs to people. Hello to Rosemary, who just loves Scary Four. And we've got uh, Catherine Ann loving it. Uh, Dada, Dada from Prague listening in. Someone's listening to Scary Four now on Alexa. How clever is that? And uh, someone from Montrose, Nori. Um, oh, Robert McInnes can't wait for Scary Four. Um, Crystal from Germany, uh, Helen from London, Susan from Greenock, hi Gail, hi Julia from Norfolk, uh, oh, uh, Kato from Milwaukee, and uh, Viv from Montrose, whoa, there's just loads of people, lots of fans actually, there's Fiona Campbell saying how much she loves Skeddy for being lucky enough to see them live twice, and uh, Thanks to everyone for telling us. Jack C. Benjamin from the Colonies and there's Andrew from Sunny Salford. Anyway, next up we have the fabulous John McCusker and Michael McGoldrick. How are you doing, guys? Very hey, well, Simon. <laughs> Simon, has anybody said anything about me and Mike yet? Uh, no, actually. <laughs> Not a single from anywhere, like anywhere at all in the world. Like no, Sunny Salford, round the corner from Sunny Stratford. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that actually how no, but then if you were to look at your social media work, you would understand why. <laughs> why? 
You mean because we don't have a website or anything like that? Good, yeah, yeah. Gen- uh, generally useless. <laughs> yeah. I did find Mike's fan card Alan. page the other day there, though. I was quite surprised at that. <laughs> Mike, Michael McGoldrick, you haven't done. You haven't had a website ever, have you? Ever, have you ever, ever, ever no. in thirty years? Not web, not one website. No. <laughs> well, I you can play. The, I'm a, I'm a, the reason I'm people don't get in off. touch. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a call anytime. I'll answer the phone. Sometimes you can try too hard. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like Batman. They just put the big symbol for Mike McGoldrick and the big light. <laughs> yeah. You know, like... <laughs> cannons and everything. Well, anyway, uh, you guys yeah. have just released a brand new album with John Dowell called The Reed That Bends in the Storm. How did the three of you meet? Mm-hmm. Transatlantic sessions, was it, John? As a trio, well, myself and Mike met when we were 17. Mike had just joined Toss the Feathers. I just joined the Battlefield Band. Uh, and that's, that's nearly 30 years ago. I th- yeah, I think it was 1989, and I went to a gig in the Point and Folk Club, yeah. and you were playing with the Battlefield Band. That's the first time I, you were 17, I think. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and then ever since then, I mean, I th- yeah, we, the three of us uh, had quite similar lives. That we left, you know, home when we were 16, joined bands when we were 17, and it felt, especially myself and Mike. Felt like we always we would turn up at the same same venues, you know, same, same venues, same gigs. We ended up in lots of the same records with, you know, loads Different of folk. singers. Yeah, but it was I it was think transatlantic. I... I think that brought the three of us together. You know, yeah, we knew John, of course. You know, I didn't really bump into John like I bumped into you at festivals. I didn't do no. the American touring scene, so I kind of knew John just from people mentioning or listening to John's music on Liz Carroll and Solas. You know, before I ever met him. And then I think it was definitely, yeah, I think it was the transatlantic sessions when I met John Doyle for the first time. Yeah, I think. Okay. I, I, I used to see him when I first went to America. He was in bands like Greenfields of America and Solace with Seamus Egan. Mm-hmm. So, but I think it was, it was definitely transatlantic, brought us together every year for 10 days or two weeks, you know, at Celtic Connections. And then we would tour. And it was at the end of, one of those tours, I think it was Mike's idea of saying, why don't we just, you know, because those tours, they fly by, it's only, you know, like I say, a couple yeah. of weeks. And we didn't, we, we were enjoying hanging out. We became, you know, we were brilliant pals. And Mike said, why don't we do a few gigs? And that's probably 12 years ago, maybe a bit more. Yeah. And that's grown into what it is now, where we, you know, every, you know, once Transatlantic stops, we go on tour for six weeks and go all over the place. Yeah. So tell me about the transatlantic sessions because it's a, a massive setup. When you look at all of you on stage, how do you actually get around? In terms of just uh, traveling, even, traveling, just a yeah. There's a there's a tour bus, so we do a uh, we do a couple of nights at Celtic Connections at the console, and then we go on tour for for ten days or you know eight gigs or something after that. It's brilliant. It's every year. There's always, I mean, it's always like a brilliant gathering, but without a doubt, every year there's one or two people that completely blow you away. You know, the Rhiannon Giddens, Milk Carton Kids, et cetera, et cetera. Mom, so there's oh, always, oh, yeah. 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 Well, I've got a wee it's video brilliant. here actually for people to watch. It's just a short video of you guys in the transatlantic sessions uh, last year in Derry. Let's watch it now. Right, here we go. Oh, is that someone on the phone? Oh, there's Donald. Right, anyway, so uh, just to tell you, John, a few people have now chipped in to say hello. 
Uh, Iona Copeland <laughs> says hello, <laughs> John you. and Mike. And someone, uh, Mike says he loves the Into the Blue album. What's that? I don't, what's that album? Uh, Into the Blue is from a, a record that I made with uh, Roddy Wimble and Chris Reaver. Oh, I see. Into the did. Blue. I know that one. Yeah. So I was wondering, I've toured with Mike for 30 years and he's got no idea what you're talking about. He shows how many records you've been listening to that I've been involved in. Well, the other thing is, both you guys recently... I have... played on that album. Did you? Yeah, you played on it. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it even worse. Well, I mean, you guys do spend a lot of time together and you have been on tour for quite a good few years now with Mark Knopfler. Now that's taken you all over the world. Yeah. Um, anywhere fabulous? Everywhere fabulous. Everywhere is fabulous. I mean, we finished in the, in the States on the tour last year and the, I'd never been to Nashville, Simon. And uh, I've got to be honest with you, I thought it was brilliant. The absolutely fantastic place, great music, great scene and uh, a place I've always wanted to visit. Um so on the wish list is heading back there sometime, you know, when you, t I mean, like yourself, when you're touring all these places, if you come across somewhere, a city or a, or a country that you think, um, this is a place I'd love to spend a bit more time with because you, you, you're in and out of a place quite fast. Um, America was, a, was cause I haven't done much touring in the States. So that for me was, uh, was brilliant. What about you, John? Uh, no, I would agree. Uh, I think getting to, those tours, I mean, like any tours, but they, it's amazing going back to a place like New York. Uh, the time before that was with Donald Shaw and uh, Jerry Douglas Alley in the transatlantic sessions. And when you go back to a city like that, you, it's very familiar. And I love that feeling, you know, I never lose the love of travel. But like Mike's saying, you do, you go back somewhere and you know where to go check out local musicians, you know where to, you know, get great food. Uh, and I do I like the thing of that. I think I speak for Mike as well. We we never lose that that love of of travelling around the place. Like Mike was saying, Nashville. It was the you know the best three days we've had in a very long time. And uh, on one of these tours, you met Bob Dylan as well. We toured with Bob Dylan for uh, was it six months, maybe like sixty gigs or something. But we never met him. Uh, the, the elevator the closest I, I got was uh, like 60 shows like 30 in Europe 30 in America uh, we'd stay in the same hotel sometimes we were travelling and flying and travelling tour buses but we were in uh, somewhere in America and uh, the elevator doors opened and you got you're so used to seeing him he'd, he's hood up all the time but he just you could just see his tiny little face and we got to know his security guards pretty well uh, they were kept on telling us to step out of the way but uh, it did <laughs> Just his face and his hood pulled up, and I, I just looked at him, and he made a noise like this, eh, and that's the only uh, meeting I had with Bob <laughs> in six months. He made a uh, strange noise at me. Well, yeah, we got to see him play every night. That's amazing. Well, I mean, everyone knows that you guys are absolutely fabulous. Uh, musicians, but <clears throat> I personally didn't know until yesterday and I was just searching for a bit of the old social videos of the two of you and I came up with a bit of you uh, both, Mike, you're playing some kind of shaker and John, you're playing the 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 tambourine whilst dancing to Mark Knopfler so I thought <laughs> Is this, I thought is this on were, stage or in our bedrooms? Or? This is on stage actually <laughs> this, is, this is rehearsing and this is a new yeah, career beckons you know so I think we'll let everyone have a wee look at that. Here we go. Okay. Well, I think when people come back to if you go and look at that, you'll think, this is this is it. I've made it. <laughs> this is yeah. Um no, um Yeah, friends. So Excuse me. <clears throat> so we've talked about everything, but you let's just go back to the new album because it's your it's your second album with the trio. Is that correct? Isn't it? The first one was called the the Wishing Tree, and that was out in two thousand eighteen. Yeah. Um. This new one, uh, have you gone about it in a different way? 
Mike? Uh, I'll tell you, Simon, we, we were very good at working under pressure. That's how I put this album. And similar to the lad's story in Scary Four saying, um, doing things remotely under kind of um, when you have to, you know, that they, they were able to get this, this single out there. But we were similar to making this new record. It was it was late on. It was it was kind of December. No, it was October time when we said we need to make a record for the tour, which was coming up in February. And under pressure, we, you know, we say this thing. We we tell white lies to each other. We say things like, "Have you got any songs, John Doyle? That would be or Have you got any tunes, John?" And we say, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah." And then we go away. We, we lie to each other, and then we, we sit down and we, and we write loads of tunes for the album. Spend. <laughs> and then we send them to each other on on emails and um, and then we learn them and then we meet up and then we record so under i think this album is a bit more like leaving it to the last minute and working under pressure and it came together quite um naturally yeah well i've yeah. listened to it you, i've listened to it it sounds great actually the sound quality is Thanks. fantastic Oh, that's, that's good. I think we are, but so used to, like Mike said, you know, Mike would send me, I'd wake up in the morning because time was a fact, I'd wake up to like five really, really fast tunes. And a text from Mike said, Have you done it yet? And it'd be like the fastest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Things I've noticed. Ah! That's how I started my day for, for, you know, a week. But I think we are so used to, we can play each other, you know, we're so used to and comfortable playing with each other, we can send, you know, stuff to each other and just play on them so it's well, always fun every record's different yeah of course well if anyone would like to find out more about it it's uh, johnmccusker.co.uk you can get all the records there and uh, definitely worth checking out but we're going to watch uh, uh, the three of you with John Doyle playing at Celtic Colours possibly last year they're both playing the whistle no dancing and, uh, and uh, no, no, no cowbell. No cowbell. <laughs> That's going to be rubbish. <laughs> uh, but it's a great, it's a great number, and I have to say, John's uh, guitar playing it is fantastic. So let's watch that. <laughs> Fantastic, actually. Um, before we move on, on, just a, uh, just uh, hear somebody saying about John and Mike and John that they missed your gig in Bear's Den and hope you come back. So there's something. <laughs> People loving. Anyway, next up, we are going to talk to Daniel about Thai the Music Festival. And I thought before we chat to him, we'd have a wee chat, at the t look at the 2019 promo video.
Fantastic. What just looks such an amazing festival, Daniel. Can you hear me? Thank you, Simon. Yeah. Yeah, got you. So, um, how Thanks did the how did the festival start? Um, it was actually the idea came. It was I think the early hours of one New Year morning, after playing in Oban, and uh, many drams are had, and had this crazy idea of having a music festival back home in Tyree, and it, it sort of stayed in the back of the minds for a couple of years, and then eventually in, in 2010 we. We just uh, plucked up the courage to give it a try. Uh, so last year was our, our 10th year at EMF. Um, and the first year we managed to get 600 people and it was mostly um, locals or people that had tidy connection or went home for the summer. We're, we're, we're now uh, bringing just over 2,000 people uh, a year out of tidy for, for TMF. And we've managed wow. to sell out every year, which is great. I was going to bring in Martin because uh, it would be nice to hear him talk. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like growing up in Tyree? Um, amazing. Uh, it was a great place as a kid to grow up. You've got a lot of freedom. and um, We obviously were very lucky musically, having teachers to teach us, but also they're into football and sport or, or outside as kids at the beach. So, great place to grow up. And, uh, Mark, do you play the accordion as well as the pipes? Yeah, I studied accordion at the at the RCS many many years ago. So accordion's actually my main instrument. Which I would pick over the pipes any day. <laughs> That's fantastic. See, we, we had a fight about who was going to play accordion, who was going to play pipes, and I won that. So uh, <laughs> we both learned bagpipes uh, and accordion at and Tyree. So, um, but we actually went to see a, a happy birthday. Our, our tutor Gordon Connell had his 80th birthday last weekend. Uh, there as well, and he's, he's, I mean, he's taught people over decades in Tyree, he's still teaching to this day, he's taught a lot of people, you'll know, like Angus McPhail and Campbell from Gunner Sound, Ian Smith from Trail West, and an uh, amazing gentleman, gives his time for free, and has done for uh, 30, 40 years, so uh, have a great 80th birthday, Gordon. Uh, yeah, he's a great guy. we'll see you soon. Yeah, so um, obviously the festival's not happening this year, so um, what are the dates for next year? We're 9th to 11th next year, uh, so we're, we're very fortunate that about 60-70% of the audience have transferred their, their ticket and said they want to come uh, next year. Hi Mike. And, uh, Hi. So it's great, so many people have, have made the commitment to doing that, it's a long time away and uh, the fact that they're, they're willing to make that commitment to us allows us to continue because it's obviously concerning times for, for the industry and in any event, uh, you know, a lot of planning has already went into place for the festival this July and we've had to cancel that and we're, we're obviously just trying to move as many of those plans over to, to next year but of course there's still going to be elements that won't that won't happen and we'll need to make changes so uh, but fingers crossed we can we can return so uh, obviously Scary Vore will be Scary Vore will be performing uh, any other headliners that you know so far? Can't tell you can't tell you that so <laughs> um, that's okay the, the, good, the good news is about about uh, about half of the acts we had lined up for, for this year have already agreed to move over uh, to next year. Some just couldn't uh, for, for multiple reasons, which is understandable. So uh, right now the focus has been more on handling the ticket transfer, uh, any refunds. Some people obviously just couldn't, weren't in a position where that was financially or holidays, couldn't commit to 21 at this stage. So we've had to deal with a lot of refunds and um, but the you know, once once we have all that sorted and we can really focus on the planning, there's a bit more certainty about the, the industry overall. Of course, we'll start looking at the lineup and hopefully have some announcements soon. Well, I mean, it will be uh, great, and it's well known as a very well run festival as well, so that's great. Thank you. Right, so as we move on in this show, we're going to return to Michael McGoldrick, and that's not Michael McGoldrick. Oh. That's. Uh... <laughs> That was Daniel. Now, is Donald still here? Donald Shaw was here a minute ago. So. No, he's left us. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he Mike... said, what's that big red button doing anyway? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what this does. So, Mike, this is the 20th anniversary of uh, your album Fused. How did that, how did yeah. it, how did it come about? Uh, how, well, 
how did 20 years go by, Simon? That's what I ask. It's like 20 years has just flown by so fast and then realised it's it's 20 years from the album Fused I recorded with Donald Shaw as the producer. And uh, I thought, I just had an idea at Celtic Connections to fancy doing a gig. And then I spoke to the agent who said, it's a great idea to actually celebrate 20 years of the album you made. And uh, then a friend did a bit of uh, research and did some interviews with other musicians in the, the band itself and how it came about the recording and where we recorded it. And when we didn't, I, I, I suppose it ran for about a year or two years and then I made another album and joined different bands and the logistics of getting everybody together on that on that album was was a bit of a nightmare because it was there was lots of different guests from different places different countries so it was uh, well unfortunately under the circumstances we can't do any of the festivals that we were booked to play at this year but like the lads were saying there we've we've uh, we've been offered the gigs for 2021 at Tuna Festival and Lorion and different festivals so we'll do 21 years of fused instead of 20 years <laughs> yeah. so did you i mean it's obviously the sound uh was something different i mean was that the sound that you were looking for that sort of swinging sort of grooving the, sound it was it was a, a definitely you know from influences of listening to a lot of say everything from weather report to uh to shakti for zaka hussein indian tablet player to listen to lots of ECM records at the time, Jan Garbarek and Mario Cacci on drums and Oregon, um, kind of a fusion band. And uh, yeah, I just tried to get all them sounds on an album that was influenced at the time. And, and uh, I was very happy with it. And Donald, Donald's amazing. Donald Shaw's an incredible producer. He was into the same music as well. I was, I, I also listened to a lot of Kappa Kaley albums and just, being in the in that zone and in and and making you know I could try something and he'd say yeah let's get let's make this work by trying this and that's you know he, he took the seat and the producer seat and did a brilliant job on the album and I just put the front cover up there because that was quite an iconic image at the time the two matches it, it can kind of inspired from a trad album nothing to do with the matches but there was a trad album of Mary Bergen she's a fantastic whistle player and. She she had an album of a little bird. It was the first album, Fodder Stain, and I I just loved that image of nothing to do with the music or anything. And uh, I, I spoke to um, spoke to a couple of friends who were designers at the time, and one of them sent that image to me. The matches a lad from Glasgow, Martin, and uh, yeah, I just went with that idea. It was it was not my concept. It was somebody a designer's concept who came up with the idea of the title. Yeah. Oh, fantastic! That's Roshi Nan Hughes. She's just saying what an album it is. <laughs> um, we've actually got a little clip of it actually the opening of the album the James Brown's March who was James Brown well the famous James Brown the idea came from listening to I was watching a video of James Brown and uh, the drummer was playing a, a shuffle groove and then I, tried, I thought that's a brilliant groove and I'll try that on the bow run so I recorded the bow run first and then I wrote the tune over the Bowron groove, or over the James Brown groove. So that's how that tune came about. Yeah. All right. Well, this is just an audio track, and we've already seen your dancing so far. So f feel free to. <laughs> 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 So here we go. <laughs> so for everyone listening at home, there's a whole lot of nonsense going on in the green room. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Great. Where's the ride? <laughs> so, um, where's the writer? <laughs> where's the writer? So, um, yeah. yeah, so hopefully we'll be celebrating 21 years of Fused uh, in 2021. Yeah. That's dead exciting. Well, I'm going to bring Great. everyone uh, back in now, and we're going to also. Who else have we got? Is Brianna there? Here comes Brianna. That's Brianna. Hi, Brianna. How's it going? Hello, I'm good. 
So, uh, How are you doing? I'm good. Brianna's going to play us a, a set of uh, tunes. Um, how are you finding the lockdown? You're currently studying at the, the Royal Conservatoire. Yeah, I'm just finishing up my second year. So, yeah, there's been a few challenges trying to get all of the uni work done online, especially when a lot of it's performance based. And, um, yeah, my Wi-Fi also isn't the best. So it's <laughs> it's been a bit tough at times, but, um, you know, we're making it work. So. Yeah, and you recently won a Danny Kyle Open Stage Award with your band Taran. Yeah, uh, just at Celtic Connections there in January. So that was pretty exciting. Oh, this is very good, actually. Very good. Well, um, just want to thank you all, guys, for um, being part of this today. It's been lots of fun, lots of nonsense. Thanks, Simon. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. Thank you. And uh, everyone um, will be able to watch this again. Uh, it'll be live. It'll be able to watch straight away. You'll be able to make sense of some of it. And uh, uh, it's also available as a podcast on iTunes. And on, we'll be back on Wednesday at 2 p.m. And we have Tidelines, Rachel Newton and the She. Anyway, are you ready to go, Brianna? Yep. Right, let's go. Um, so I'm just going to play a tune that I wrote um, a while ago called Alistair McDonald's Real. So I'll have a go at that. <laughs> Fantastic.